The Tale of the Selkie Bride Long ago, on a wild Scottish coast, a fisherman spent all day at sea, but he caught only a few very small fish. As the sun began to set, the fisherman still had only a meager catch, but when night fell, he rowed to shore and beached his little boat. As he walked toward his little cottage across the pebbly beach, he heard beautiful voices singing a sweet, high, lyrical, and lovely tune, a song more beautiful than any he had ever heard. He turned toward the sound and saw what few have ever seen. There, near the water, a dozen selkie people were laughing and playing and singing. The fisherman could not believe his eyes. Few ever saw the seal folk who, now and then, cast aside their skins and took on human forms to play on shore. The fisherman stood and stared, but when the selkie people noticed him, they quickly dived into the sea, and slipping beneath the rolling waves, they disappeared. I must have been a dreamin', said the fisherman aloud, and again, he turned toward his cottage. But something nagged at him, so he turned again, and this time he noticed something sleek and shiny lying on a rock. He walked closer, and now he saw it was a seal skin. No one will ever believe I've seen the Selkies unless I show them this, he said. And so he leaned over and picked up the skin and slung it over his shoulder. And as he walked, he whistled, and then he suddenly stopped. My, what a fine penny I'll earn by selling this. And just as he said this, he heard footsteps close behind him, and, fearing a thief, he quickly turned to look. Now there was no thief behind him. No, indeed. No, it was an exquisitely beautiful young woman standing there, but she was weeping so hard, it nearly caused the fisherman's heart to break. Beautiful lady, he said, why do you weep? She sniffed and looked into his eyes. Kind sir, she said, choking back tears, you have my sealskin. Kindly give it back, for I belong to the Selkies, and I cannot live under the sea without my skin. The fisherman could not stop staring. You see, he had fallen in love at first sight, and, because he was a young man, and terribly headstrong, he thought he must keep her with him. He clutched the sealskin to his chest, pressing it to his pounding heart. Dear lady, he said gently, be my wife, for I have fallen madly in love with you, and without your sealskin you'll have to live on land. I'll make you happy, that I promise. Please, sir, she cried. My folk will be so worried. I must go home. Never could I be happy on land. But the young man was stubborn. He was that way. So he smiled as sweetly as he could, bowed his head, and bent down on one knee. Dear woman, my cottage is a cozy place. I'll keep you warm by the fire. I'll feed you plentifully all the fish fresh from the sea you could ever wish to eat. I promise you will live a happy life on land as my bride." The young woman fe felt helpless without her skin. "'I fear I must go home with you until you will return my skin,' said she, and seeing this, he took her hand and led her to his home. For many weeks the fisherman kept the seal skin with him for he feared his bride-to-be would steal it and slip away. But, after a while, the sweet lady began to settle in to this life on land, and when the fisherman saw she felt happy, he stuffed the skin inside a crevice in the chimney. There, my girl will never find it, he said to himself. Another month went by, and they married, and time passed very nicely indeed. He led a happy life, for though the fisherman was stubborn, 
he was also kind and generous. He truly loved his wife, and he always worked hard to make her happy. After a while, the Selkie woman grew to love her stubborn husband, and sometimes she would sing to him. Those nights, he was the happiest man in the world. And as the years passed, the couple had seven children, and the silky woman loved these lads and lassies with all her heart. Most of the time, the family was very happy, though every once in a while, the children would find their mother on the beach, gazing wistfully out to the sea. They would circle her and ask, Mother, why do you look so sad? And she would shake her head and kiss their foreheads. Never you mind, she told her children. I've only been dreaming too long. One day, the fisherman and the three eldest children went out in their boat to catch fish. The next three walked to the village to buy some bread and milk, and the mother and her youngest son stayed home alone. Now the mother looked out the window and watched the waves crashing on shore. Far in the distance, she noticed on the slick black rocks a band of seals playing and barking. She sighed deeply, and her eyes filled with tears. Her youngest son ran to her side. Mother, what's wrong? he asked. Whenever you look out to the sea, you grow so sad. Without thinking, she turned and said, I am sad because I was born in the sea. It's the home to which I never can return because your father hid my seal skin. Now the boy, like all children in Scotland, had heard tales of the Selkie folk. So, right away, he knew what his mother must be, and he ran to the fireplace, reached up, and pulled the seal skin from its hiding place. He held it out to his mother. How did you find it? She asked, astonished at the sight of her skin. One day, I was here alone with father, said the boy, and he took this from the hiding place and stared at it. I knew it was special, and now I understand what it is. The woman embraced the seal skin and then reached for her child and embraced him. My darling, she whispered, I will always love you. And then, clasping sealskin to her heart, she ran outside and down to the sea. She slipped into her skin and dived into the bracing water. Soon after that moment, as they were heading home, the fisherman and his children rode past a group of seals. As they passed, the fisherman noticed a sleek young seal gazing at the boat, a strange expression on her face. And just as they were motoring out of sight, he heard that seal cry, a plaintive sound, and then she disappeared underwater. When the fisherman arrived home, he learned what had happened and felt his heart breaking in two. But he understood his son was a loving boy. He was braver and more generous than the fisherman had ever been. Forever afterwards, the fisherman and the children missed the sulky woman. But knowing she was happy in the world where she belonged gave them a measure of joy. Male selkies are described as being very handsome in their human form and having great seductive powers over human women. They typically seek those who are dissatisfied with their lives, such as married women waiting for their fishermen husbands. If a woman wishes to make contact with a selkie male, she must shed seven tears into the sea. If a man steals a female selkie skin, she is in his power and is forced to become his wife. The difference between the two can definitely be seen in the story of Ursula versus the story of the Selkie Bride. 
The story of Ursula is as follows. The following account was documented by the Orkney antiquarian and folklorist Walter Trail Dennison towards the end of the 19th century. In a paper published in 1893 in the pages of the Scottish Antiquary, he recounts the semi-mythical tale of an Orcadian woman who, after sleeping with a sulky man, falls pregnant and produces offspring with distinct traits. He kindly changed the name as to not bring shame on her family or embarrass her descendants. Ursula was the daughter of a laird belonging to one of the oldest families in Orkney. She was handsome and pretty, but had a sternness of manner, and that firmness of features, which often presents as a masculine exterior in families of Norse blood, and often hides, as with a film of ice, a loving heart within. Ursula was not one to wait patiently till someone showed up to offer himself as her husband. Indeed, had anyone presumed to approach her as a lover, she would have treated him with haughty disdain, regarding his bold presumption as sufficient grounds for his rejection. She determined not to be chosen, but to choose for herself. Her choice fell on a handsome young fellow who acted as her father's barn man, but she knew that any disclosure of her passion would mortally offend her father and bitterly mortify his family pride and might lead him to disinherit her. So she locked up her love in her own breast, kept watchful eye on the object of her love, and treated him to a full share of the scoldings she daily bestowed on the servants. When, however, her father died, and her dowry was safe, she disclosed her passion to the young man and commanded him to marry her, a command which he was too gallant to disobey. Her marriage excited among the gentry great indignation to think that one of their class should marry a farm servant. Ursula treated their contempt with indifference. She made a good housewife, managed her house well, and also, it was said, managed her husband and the farm. At this point, Dennison went to great pains to remind his readers that the information he had provided so far was valid, but that which followed was merely an imaginary tale invented by gossips in order to account for a strange phenomenon visibly seen in her descendants. The tale, he states, is only given to illustrate one of the popular beliefs. Yes, Ursula was married, and all went well and happily, so far as outward appearances showed. Yet, Ursula was not happy. If disappointed in her husband, she was far too proud to acknowledge it, knowing that the gentry would only say in derision, she shaped her own cloth, let her well wear her ill-fitting dress. Whatever the cause might be, there was a terrible want, a want that Ursula felt bitterly, and she was not the woman to sit down and cry over her sorrow. She determined to console herself by having intercourse with one of the silky folk. She went at early morning and sat on a rock at high tide mark, and when it was high tide she shed seven tears in the sea. People said they were the only tears she ever shed. but. You know this is what one must do if she wants speech with the silky folk. Well, as the first glimpse of dawn made the waters gray, she saw a big silky swimming for the rock. He raised his head and says he to her, What's your will with me, fair lady? She likely told him what was in her mind, and he told her he would visit her at the seventh stream, springtide, for that was the time he could come in human form. So, when the time was come, he came, and they met over and over again. And, doubtless, it was not for good that they met so often. Anyway, when Ursula's bairns were born, every one of them had webbed hands and webbed feet, 
like the paws of a selkie. And did not that tell a tale? The midwife clipped the webs between every finger and between every toe of each bairn. She showed the shears that she used to my grandmother, so said the narrator, and many a clipping Ursula clipped to keep the fins from growing together again, and the fins not, not being allowed to grow in their natural way, they grew to a horny crust on the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. And this horny substance is seen in many of Ursula's descendants to this day. Whatever may be thought of this tale, its last sentence is quite true. The horn still appears on feet and hands of some of the lady's descendants. One, two, or three in a family may show the abnormal horny substance, while brothers and sisters are entirely free from the troublesome horn. Although Denison put no real faith in the folklore origin of this horny crust found on the hands and feet of some of Ursula's descendants, the condition at least was verified. Some ten years ago, while engaging a harvest hand, I said to one of these men, Of course you can do all kinds of harvest work? Oh, na, nah, sir, he said. Another of the same family told me that when, through the growth of the horn, he was unable to walk or work, he would, with hammer and chisel, cut off large slices of horn from the soles of his feet. This growth is by no means confined to those engaged in manual labor. I have felt it on the hands of one of the same race who followed a profession where manual labor was not required. This curious phenomenon seems to be well worthy of careful investigation by the physiologist. Pity it could not be traced to the seal, we might then be in sight of the missing link. Many wild tales were told of the offspring of such strange parentage, who had webbed hands and feet, but the foregoing will serve to illustrate a once popular belief. The Great Selkie O Sewell Scary, Version 2. In Norway land there lived a maid, Hush be Lou Lily, this maid began. I know not where my baby's father is, whether by land or sea does he travel in. It happened on a certain day, when this lady fell fast asleep, that in came a good grey Selkie and set him down at her bed feet, saying, Awake, awake, my pretty maid, for, oh, how sound as thou dost sleep, and I'll tell thee where thy baby's father is, he's sitting close at thy bed feet. I pray, come, tell to me thy name, oh, tell me where dost thy dwelling be. My name, it is good Hein Mailer, and I earn my living out o' the sea. I am a man upon the land, I am a selkie in the sea, and when I'm far fray every stand, my dwelling is in Sewell Scary. Alas, alas, this woeful fate, this weary fate that's been laid for me, that a man should come from the waste ahoy to the Norway lands to have a bairn with me. My dear, I'll wed thee with a ring, with a ring, my dear, I'll wed with thee. Though may go wed these weddings with whom thou wilt, for I'm sure thou'll never wed none with me. Thou wilt nurse my little wee son for seven long years upon thy knee, and at the end of seven years I'll come back and pay the nourish fee. Now he had taken a purse of gold, and he has put it upon her knee, saying, Give to me my little young son, and take thee up thy nourish fee. She says, My dear, I'll wed thee with a ring, with a ring, my dear, I'll wed with thee. Thou may go wed with these weddings with whom thou wilt, for I'm sure thou'll never wed none with me. 
but I'll put a gold chain around his neck. And gay good gold chain it'll be, that if ever he comes to the Norway lands, thou may have a gay good guess on he, and thou will get a gunner good, and a gay good gunner it will be, and he'll get gay good on May morning, and shoot the sun and the gray selkie. Oh, she has got a gunner good, and gay good gunner it was he, and he went out on a May morning, and he shot the sun and the gray selkie. When the gunner returned from his expedition, he showed the Norway woman the gold chain he had found round the neck of a young seal, and a final verse expresses her grief. Alas, alas, this woeful fate, this weary fate that's been laid for me. And once or twice she sobbed and sighed, and her tender heart did break in three. Thank you.